All right, chapter 249, The Resurrection Man's Last Feet at Ravensworth Hall. Okay, you'll remember when we last left Adeline, Lady Ravensworth, uh, she was at her house alone. She'd returned from France because she lost her child. Her mind and her conscience were uneasy over what had happened to Lydia, whose body was just discovered. Um, she's returned to Ravensworth Hall, and the Resurrection Man was indeed there, and now he's confronted her, so we'll see. God protect me, shrieked Adeline, staggering to a sofa on which she fell, but her senses did not leave her. A profound conviction of the terrible position in which she was again placed suddenly nerved her with a courage and a strength that astonished even herself. And starting from the sofa, she confronted the Resurrection Man, saying, What do you hear? That's my business, answered Tidkins gruffly. You see that I am here. Here I have been for a long time, and here I shall remain as long as it suits my purpose. That is, he added with a significant leer, unless you make it worth my while to take myself off. Detestable extortioner, exclaimed Adeline. Am I never to know peace again? Well, that's your business, my lady, replied the resurrection man. The fact is, I find this place so much to my liking, and it answers my views as well to as my safety so well that I am in no hurry to quit it. You may look as black as you please, but you ought to know by this time that Tony Tidkins is not the man to be frightened by a lady's frown. The law will protect me, said Adeline, now laboring under the most painful excitement. The law will, yes, and punish you too, added the resurrection man coolly. Now listen to me, continued Lady Ravensworth, speaking with hysterical volubility. Human forbearance has limits. Human patience has bounds. My forbearance is exhausted. My patience is worn out. Sooner than submit to your persecution, sooner than be at the mercy of your extortions, I will seek redress at the hands of justice. I, even though I draw down his vengeance upon my own head at the same time. And she flew towards the bell pole. But the resurrection man caught her ere her hand could reach the rope, and dragging her back, he pushed her brutally upon the sofa. Then drawing a pistol from his pocket, he said in a terribly on ominous tone, If you attempt that dodge again, I'll shoot you through the head as sure as you're now a living woman. Adeline contemplated him with eyes expressive of the wildest alarm. You see that it's no use to play tricks with me, young lady, continued the resurrection man as he placed the pistol in his pocket. What is it that you require? asked Adeline in a faint and supplicating tone. What can I do to induce you to depart and never molest me more? Oh, have mercy upon me, I implore you. Have mercy upon me. I have no friends to protect me. I am widowed and childless. My poor boy has been snatched from me. My sole earthly solace is gone. But why do you persecute me thus? Have I ever injured you? If you hate me, if you look upon me as an enemy, kill me outright. Do not, do not take my life by inches. Your presence is slow torture. Will you listen to reason? demanded Tidkins. Can you speak calmly for a few minutes? I will. I can, returned Adeline, shuddering dreadfully as the resurrection man drew nearer her. Well, then, if you keep your word, our business will soon be brought to an end, he said, planting himself coolly in a chair opposite to her. You must know that I've been living in this house almost ever since you left. Living here, cried Adeline, indignation mastering a considerable portion of her terror. Yes, living here as snug as a bug in a rug, returned Titkins, chuckling as if he considered the fact an excellent joke. The truth is, I had certain reasons of my own for being either in or near London, and I looked about for a safe place. Happening to pass this way a few weeks after that business about Vernon, you know. Proceed, proceed, said Adeline impatiently. I'm in no hurry, replied Titkins, but my servant may come. Quentin will be here shortly. I expect him every minute. He won't hurt me, my lady, said Titkins calmly. If he attempted to lay a hand on me, I'd shoot him on the spot. However, I will go on quicker since you wish it. Well, as I said, I was pa I passed by this way and saw the house all shut up. Inquiries at the village down yonder let me know that she was gone and that there was no one but an old man and his wife about the premises. Nothing could suit me better. I resolved to take my quarters here directly, and I pitched upon the very room where Vernon threw himself out of the window. One day I heard, heard the, old, the two old people talking in the next apartment, which they were dusting, and I found out by their discourse that they believed in ghosts. That was a glorious discovery for me. I soon saw that certain little devices which I practiced made them think that Vernon's spirit haunted the place, and so I boldly opened the shutters and made myself comfortable when I took it into my head. They, were the, they weren't at the house, it seems, when I was staying here two years ago, and so they didn't know who I really was. 
Thus, when they saw me standing in the balcony, which I often did just to amuse myself by frightening them a little, they firmly believed it was Gilbert Vernon's spirit that haunted the place. How I have laughed sometimes at the poor old souls. It was you then, cried Adeline, a sudden idea striking her, who have been plundering the hall during my absence. Well, you may call it by that name if you like, said Tidkins, with the most provoking calmness. I don't hesitate to admit that I have now and then walked off with a small picture or a timepiece or a mantle ornament or what not, just to raise supplies for the time being. But you ought to be very much obliged to me that I've left anything at all in the whole place. Such forbearance isn't quite in keeping with my usual disposition. Villain! This to me, and said so coolly, cried Lady Ravensworth again, starting from her seat. Pray keep where you are, ma'am, offered Titkins, pushing her back again upon the sofa. You promised to listen to reason. Reason, exclaimed Adeline. And do you call it reason when I am compelled to hear the narrative of your villainies, the history of your depredations on my property? You knew what I was when you sought my acquaintance, said the resurrection man, and after all, I've only been just taking the little liberties which one friend may use with another. Friend, repeated Adeline in a tone expressive of deep disgust as she retreated as far back upon the sofa as possible. Come, we're only wasting time by all this disputing, said the resurrection man. The whole thing lies in a nutshell. You've come home again and you want to enjoy undisputed possession of your own house. Well, that is reasonable enough. But by so doing, you turn me out of doors and I don't exactly know where I shall find a crib so safe and convenient as this. I must have an indemnity then and that is only reasonable on my part. "'Until you told me that you had robbed the house,' exclaimed Adeline, in a tone of almost ungovernable indignation, such as she had not experienced for a long time. "'I was prepared to purchase your departure with a sum of money, but now, now that I have the most convincing proofs of your utter profligacy, even if such proofs were wanting, now that I see the folly of reposing the slightest trust in one who studies nothing save his own wants and interests, I will think of a compromise no longer.' You will repent your obstinacy, said Titkins. Remember how you have dared me on a former occasion and how I reduced you to submission. True, said Adeline, in a calmer and more collected tone than she had yet assumed during this painful interview. But at that time I was crushed by the weight of difficulties, overwhelmed with embarrassments and perils of the most formidable nature. I would then have committed any new crime to screen the former ones. I would have effected any compromise in order to avert danger. But now, what is there to bind me to existence? Nothing unless it be the enjoyment of seclusion and tranquility. These are menaced by your persecutions, and I will put an end to this intolerable tyranny or perish in the attempt. That is my decision. Let us be at open war, if you will, and thus, and tis thus I commence hostilities. Rapid as thought, she darted to the bell rope, but Titkins, who had divined her intention, intercepted her as before. Placing his iron hand on the nape of her neck, he thrust her violently back upon the sofa. Then, ere he withdrew his hold, he said in a low, hoarse, and ferocious tone, This is the last time I will be trifled with. By Satan, young woman, I will strangle you if this game continues, just as I strangled your Lydia Hutchinson. And pushing her with contemptuous rudeness from him, he released her from his grasp. For a few moments, Adeline's breath came with so much difficulty and her bosom heaved so convulsively that the resurrection man feared he had gone too far and had done her some grievous injury. But when he saw her recover from the semi-strangulation and the dreadful alarm which she had experienced in consequence of his treatment, his eyes glistened with ferocious satisfaction. Let us make a long business short, he said in a coarse and imperious tone. If I told you just now that I had helped myself to a few of the things in this house, it was only to convince you that I am not likely to stick up trifles in respect to yours, you and yours. You have money and I want some. Give me my price and you shall never see me again. No, you may murder me if you will, cried Adeline hysterically, but I will not submit to your tyranny any more. Oh, you are a terrible man, and I would sooner die than live in the constant terror of your persecution. Foolish woman, give up this screeching, or by hell, I'll settle you and then help myself to all I want, cried Titkins ferociously. And at that same moment, Adeline, whose face was buried in her hands, felt his iron grasp again upon the nape of her neck. She started up with a half-stifled scream and endeavored to reach the bell pull a third time, but once more she was anticipated in her design, and the resurrection man now held her firmly round the waist by his left arm. Then drawing forth the pistol with his right hand, he placed the muzzle against Adeline's marble forehead. I must put an end to this nonsense at once, he said in a ferocious tone. There is something now in the house, proud and obstinate woman as you are, that will make you fall on your knees and beseech me to remove it from your sight. But we will try that test and remember this pistol that touches your forehead is loaded. Attempt to raise an alarm and I blow your brains out. 
Release me, let me go, I implore you, murmured Adeline, who experienced greater loathing at that contiguity with the resurrection man than fear at the weapon which menaced her with instantaneous death. No, you shall come, returned Tidkins brutally. I am sick of this reasoning and must bring you to the point at once. Let me go and I swear to follow whether you may choose to lead. Well, now I release you on that condition, was the reply, and the horrible man withdrew his arm and the pistol simultaneously. But still keeping the weapon leveled at the wretched lady and taking a candle in his left hand, he made a sign for her to accompany him. She was now reduced to that state of physical nervousness and mental bewilderment that she obeyed mechanically without attempting to remonstrate, without even remembering to ask whither they were going. <laughs> they left the room and proceeded along the passage toward the the southern extremity of the building. Adeline walked on one side of the corridor and Tidkins on the other, the latter still keeping the pistol leveled at the overawe, to overawe the miserable woman. But she saw it not. She went on because she mechanically obeyed one in whose power she felt herself to be, and whose loathsome contiguity she trembled to dare again. At length they stopped at a door, and then Adeline's memory seemed to recover all its powers. Her ideas instantly appeared to concentrate themselves in one focus. Oh, no, not here, she said with a cold shudder as she suddenly awoke, as it were, from a confused dream and recognized her the door of her boudoir, the boudoir. Then give me a thousand pounds and I will leave this house this minute, returned Tidkins. No, you shall kill me first, said Adeline, again recovering courage and strength as if by instinct. She knew herself to be standing upon some fearful precipice. I will resist you to death. You have driven me to desperation. And springing toward the resurrection man, she made a snatch at the pistol which he held in his hand. But eluding her attack, he thrust the weapon into his pocket. Then clasping her with iron vigor in his right arm, he's, and still retaining the light in his left, he burst open the door of the boudoir with his foot. Adeline uttered a faint scream as he dragged her into the room, the door of which he closed violently behind them. Then holding the light in such a manner that its beams fell upon the floor, and withdrawing his arm from Adeline's waist, he exclaimed in a tone of ferocious triumph, Behold the remains of the murdered Lydia Hutchinson. Lady Ravensworth threw one horrified glance upon the putrid corpse, and uttering a terrific scream expressive of the most intense agony, she fell upon the floor, her face touching the feet of the dead body. Tidkins, Tidkins raised her, but the blood gushed out of her mouth. Wow. Perdition, I have gone too far, cried the resurrection man. She is dead, and I have done as good as cut my own throat. It was indeed true. Adeline had burst a blood vessel and died upon the spot. Like I said before, when given the choice between something that feels probable and something that's dramatic, these authors always chose drama. I knew when Adeline came back and she was so... um beaten down by her own conscience that she wasn't going to survive to the end of the story. It just was kind of how these character arcs worked at this time, but this was not how I expected it to go. <laughs> Titkins let her fall heavily upon the floor and throwing down the candle fled from the mansion, reckless whether the light were extinguished, extinguished or not. So there's a fire. Oh man. Half an hour afterwards, Quentin was on his return to the hall in a hackney coach containing, besides the baggage which he had cleared at the custom house, several hampers filled with the purchases he had been making in the city. As he was thus proceeding through the park, he suddenly observed a strong and flickering light appearing through the windows at the southern extremity of the building, and in a few moments the whole of that part of the hall was enveloped in flames. Leaping from the coach, which, being heavily laden, dragged slowly along, the valet rushed to the mansion where the presence of the fire had already alarmed the gardener and his wife and the French servant. Okay, good. I was a little bit afraid they were going to get caught in the fire, and that was going to be really, really tragic. But of what avail were their poor exertions against the fury of the devouring element? A search was immediately instituted for Lady Ravensworth, but she was not to be found in either of the drawing rooms, nor was she in any of the chambers in the northern part of the building, and it was impossible to enter the southern wing, which seemed to be one vast body of flame. The domestics, finding their search to be useless, were compelled to form the dreadful conclusion that their mistress had perished in the conflagration. For six hours did the fire rage with appalling fury, and though the inhabitants of the adjacent village and the immediate neighborhood flocked to the scene of desolation and rendered all the assistance in their power, the splendid mansion was reduced to a heap of ruins. Well, I think we kind of knew something like that had to happen, right? With all the tragedy that occurred at that house and with Adeline's conscience weighing so heavy on her. And, and the stories of the Victorian era tended to include these really drastic forms of restitution and repentance and um, coming full circle on things. It kind of makes sense that that's what happened.
But the resurrection man got away. I'm going to guess we will see him again in the like five chapters that remain in this. So, okay, we'll see. Thank you.